Great. Our next speaker is Ashley DePriest. She's formerly a Grady, but now she's relocated to Northside. She's a nutritionist. who will be speaking to us about uh, nutrition in the ICU. Hello. Um, so, like you said, my name is Ashley. I am a nutrition support team member at um, Northside Hospital currently, formerly at um, Grady Hospital in the ICU, the neuro ICU there. And so um, I was asked to speak on updates in feeding the critically ill patient. Um, as a lot of you may know, there were some new guidelines um, published last year. Uh, with SECM and Aspen, and um, there was a lot of different topics. Some things changed, some things stayed the same, as they always do. Um, but I wanted to focus in on one aspect of um, something that was new this year, and that was the idea of assessing patients in the critically ill, um, assessing the critically ill patients for a nutrition risk score. Um, so I want to talk about the process of how we assess patients for nutrition risk. Um, be able to maybe to help you guys identify those critically ill patients that have the highest scores and then describe what that means and what you can expect from your um, nutrition therapy for those patients. So a little bit about previous practices and what you guys may be used to. Um, of course, we've kind of been doing this early screening thing for a while. I think the Joint Commission started requiring a nutrition screen for all um, admitted patients of, around the mid-90s, um, but they never really said what that screen needed to be. So a lot of hospitals have um, a different screen. Sometimes it's just, how was your appetite? Have you lost weight? Sometimes it's a little more extensive. Um, we also have traditionally assessed things like prealbumin and albumin, um, which I hope everybody here has stopped using as markers for nutritional status. Um, and then finally, I think one we still use are just general anthropometrics, right? I'm sure a lot of us have, have looked at a patient and said, oh, man, they look malnourished, or oh, man, oh, they probably could go a couple of days. And so I'm hoping to maybe change your idea on that um, today. Um, of course, uh, as we all know as well, um, the data um, in nutrition and critically ill patients is very conflicting. One study says feed early, feed fast, feed a lot, and then the next study says, whoa, wait a second, maybe we shouldn't feed so much. Um, we also have this idea of what we call the obesity paradox, where um, certain populations of obese patients tend to do better than those non-obese patients. So in the elderly, for example, um, also chronic dialysis patients tend to do better um, when they have a higher BMI. So what, is, what does that tell us? And then, of course, with um, a couple of trials, uh, I'm calling out the EDEN trial, um, for example, um, was a study that compared trophic feeding to full feeding and found no difference. Um, so that's one of those studies we've kind of come back to and said, what was, what was wrong here? Why did we not find a difference in feeding patients more adequately um, rather than just trophic feeds? And so um, the new concept of nutrition risk has really started to answer that question. And I would like to go ahead and say that, of course, this is still just expert consensus. Um, most of the studies have been observational in nature um, so far, but I think that this is kind of where we're going for, future, um, for the future of a lot of different critical care studies with nutrition. Um, but essentially, there have been some um, prospective studies, mostly retrospective, like I said, um, reevaluating some of the older clinical trials um, and, and adding this component of nutritional risk. And with that component, we actually have found that there is a difference in our outcomes with um, our nutrition therapy based on a patient either, either at high risk or at low risk nutritionally. Um, so again, also um, some studies have been reevaluated looking at the obesity paradox, and when we consider the nutritional status of a patient or the nutrition risk of a patient, the um, obesity paradox kind of goes away. So for example, we may have had a group of obese patients that traditionally we say are doing better, but when we look at them a little bit closer and compare the actual nutritional status of that patient, um, they tend to, we, we tend to find a difference. So a well-nourished obese patient versus an obese patient who maybe actually have been having a poor appetite and losing weight um, does worse than that well-nourished um, obese patient. Uh, so with that, how do we assess nutrition risk? And there's uh, a couple of different tools that have been uh, most heavily studied. The Nutrix score is the first one um, that has the most research behind it, and it's a pretty extensive um, evaluation, as you can see. It involves not only the age of a patient, but the Apache 2 score, a SOFA score. You also consider the number of comorbidities as well as um, number of days in the ICU. Um, there is an interleukin-6 um, evaluation also included, but luckily um, this score has been validated both with and without the, the interleukin-6 score, so you don't, have to, you don't have to have that if it's not available. Um, another tool is the uh, Nutrition Risk Screening, NRS 2002. 
Um, it's a little bit less extensive. Um, essentially, there's an initial screening um, that is typically done at the bedside, maybe bedside nursing um, does this. And it asks those general questions like BMI, um, have you had any weight changes in the last few months, um, any reduced intake, poor appetite. And then if, if those are positive questions, then you go on to a more extensive um, evaluation, which is typically done by the nutrition expert, um, IRD, et cetera. Um, and those questions consider more of the disease severity and um, on what's going on a little more in detail. So how do we use this information? What does this mean? Uh, of course, this hasn't changed. We still want to feed our critically ill patients, and we still want to feed them early um, because the benefits of early enteral nutrition specifically are, are not limited to um, just your calories and protein. We still want to maintain um, the, the villi. We still want to maintain the enterocytes and the, um, their, their tight junctions together um, to keep translocation from happening. Um, and we know that early enteral nutrition is good. So that has not changed. But the thing that maybe has changed or may be changing is how aggressive we are with feeding um, critically ill patients. Of course, we want to consider the severity score um, as well as projected length of stay and the prognosis and expected prognosis in a patient. And another key component to all of this is that this severity needs to be reassessed routinely. This is not something that's just done on admission and then you forget about it and move on. This is something that needs to be continually reevaluated. And, and my argument is that this probably should be reevaluated re on a daily basis um, in many critically ill patients. And of course, utilizing your nutrition expert for that, um, the registered dietitian, it's, that's our wheelhouse. So um, utilizing them for that assessment is very important. So just to kind of recap, you have your low nutrition risk score patients. They have the lower need um, for full feeding, especially early. But you have to consider the projected length of stay and prognosis for improvement. So for example, if you have a patient that is ventilated and you expect them to remain on that ventilator for several months, um, you may want to be a little more aggressive because this is not just a temporary thing. This is going to be their lifestyle for a few, for a few months. Whereas if you're, you're looking to wean that, or you expect them to get better within the next week, maybe not as aggressive. Um, and again, just to point out, this doesn't mean we're purposely withholding feedings in the first week. If you can use the gut, you want to use it and keep it stimulated, even if it's not full feeding. Um, in your typical ARDS ALI, no, low nutrition risk patient, this is kind of going back to the Eden trial. Um, you do want to at least consider trophic feeds over the first week. Um, and that was actually one of the um, controversies around the Eden trial was that um, most of those patients were not malnourished and they actually were pretty well nourished patients. So maybe that's why they didn't see a difference. Um, but for now, the recommendation is to continue trophic feeds at least for that first week. And again, we're expecting, um, we're, we're looking at the expected length of stay and prognosis as well. Maybe you don't want to start a feed on someone that, that is not expected to survive past three or four days. Just something to consider. And then finally, the high nutrition risk. This is where a lot of us may be changing our tune um, in terms of feeding these critically ill patients. So when they have a high nutrition risk, these patients may require as close to full feeding as possible and as early as possible. So these are the ones that we do want to be a little more aggressive with in our feeding. Maybe start sooner, titrate up a little quicker if they, if they need that. Um, some institutions are also moving towards a volume-based approach in feeding. So instead of saying, let's feed this patient at 60 mLs an hour for the 24 hours, they're looking at this patient needs two liters of tube feeding a day, adjust the rate accordingly. Um, also, just to note, um, we're never, uh, I don't think there's really any patient population we're ever looking to feed at 100% of our recommended um, calories. 80% is about where we're looking at. And just to note, even, even in those ICUs who think we're doing really, really great, most of them get to about 60 or 70%. So um, it's a really great idea for kind of a quality, quality assessment in your ICU as well, looking at how, um, how well you're feeding. So um, just to kind of give you a little example, case one, um, this is someone I had recently. Um, she was very young, 26-year-old female. She had acute respiratory failure. She had had a little bit of bronchitis, had come to the ED, went home, um, and tried to use a homeopathic remedy, um, an inhalation sort of thing, and ended up back in the ED intubated with um, acute lung injury. Um, she had a BMI of about 29.4. Um, I estimated her Apache 2. It wasn't, wasn't horrible, right around 11. SOFA score of 5-ish. 
Um, when we spoke to her family, they mentioned there was no issues in appetite. She eats well. She eats three meals a day usually, and no recent weight changes. So where would you guys put this person in terms of nutrition risk? How many of you guys would say this is a high nutrition risk patient? And how many would say this is a low nutrition risk patient? Okay, most of you guys. Exactly. She's relatively young. Um, even though her BMI is not obese, um, she's, she's not malnourished necessarily because we know she has a good appetite and no recent weight changes and relatively low um, SOPA score and Apache 2 score. Let's change a few things about this patient, though. Let's say that she's actually a 60-year-old female, so a little bit, a little bit older, um, and with a little bit of a history. So this woman has, now has type 2 diabetes and CHF. Her BMI is 32.2. Um, Apache 2 will keep the same and SOFA will keep about the same, um, not, not a significant change. But this woman has also had a poor appetite for about two months and her husband says she looks, she definitely looks like she's lost some weight. You can see it in her face. So just changing a couple of those two things, does that change anyone's thoughts on how we, how we would feed this patient? Would we be more aggressive or less aggressive? more aggressive probably, right? She's high nutrition risk. So just considering the fact that she's a little older, she has more comorbidities, even though her BMI is higher, um, she's had a poor appetite over the last several months and she's lost weight. So she would be considered malnourished and um, would need more aggressive feeding. Um, so again, we wanna still try to feed patients, feed them early, feed them something. Um, utilize your nutrition professionals. Um, especially with malnutrition and diagnosing and nutrition risk scoring. And just really quickly, of course, high, high risk means more aggressive and maybe considering the volume-based type feedings and lower risk, you can be a little less aggressive in that first week. Thank you. Any questions?